Welcome to the Human Origin Project, where we explore the science of you. To keep up to date, go to our iTunes channel and subscribe, and please leave a review if you enjoyed today's show. Hello and welcome to the show. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most fascinating archaeological sites on the planet, located in southeastern Turkey on the Syrian border. What's so fascinating about Gobekli Tepe is that it dates right to the period when humans were undergoing the agricultural revolution. It's located right in the Fertile Crescent, which is where we attribute modern civilization as rising out of. Gobekli Tepe is a huge site, 90 football fields in size, and only less than 10% of that has been uncovered. The mystery of Gobekli Tepe goes very, very deep, so this will be one of many episodes where we explore this but today we're going to introduce it and discuss some of the implications and why Gobekli Tepe really is potentially history changing. We hope you enjoy today's show. If you have any ideas or research areas you feel are important to this conversation we want to hear them. There are going to be many more discussions on this topic. We hope you enjoy today's show on Gobekli Tepe. Hey Steph, how are you man? Yeah good, good. How are you doing? I'm well. It's been a busy week but um I'm excited for today's show. This is kind of, it's a topic that really founded our first discussions in the Human Origin Project, didn't it? And um, it's fascinating. I mean, I've always been fascinated in the idea of the agricultural revolution and, you know, the Fertile Crescent where our modern civilization really came from. And, uh, you know, we're we're, we're talking about a site where it all really began. Yeah, it's like a... You hear about all these advances in culture and civilization, you think they sort of just pop up here and there and gradually develop. And then, yeah, I guess it was the same for me, discovering that there was a place where it could have potentially all happened at once is pretty mind-blowing, especially now that more information is coming out about the site and the region and, you know, everything that went on back in um, ancient times. Completely, and um, I think that's a really good kind of pretense to be have your mindset in when thinking about this topic is that we're talking about the earliest lineage and the earliest evidence of our current civilization and you know in the terms of how we live today and we don't really kind of you know we 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 just attribute that as happening happening as an accident and what we're talking about today really shows that you know maybe there's possibilities that it didn't and you know that there was stuff happening we certainly don't understand but you know, that maybe shows that there were earlier lines of, you know, ourselves that were doing something that we don't really really know about yet. And I think the the, the importance of the site was highlighted, I think it was last year, uh, the Gobekli Tepe in the surrounding area was made a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is a uh, pretty high praise for a site. And I think the more, the more that I've been learning about it, the more researchers, um, books that I've been reading and... Um, articles that have been coming out it sort of keeps pointing back to the first signs of evidence that they've seen for you know the first signs of agriculture the first signs of metalworking uh the first signs of domesticating animals and grains are in that region of the world it's all just the first of everything it's just the starting point almost and these are all principles and you know understandings about a history that are well known yet the discovery of Gobekli Tepe really you know, showed a whole new level of, of intricate detail as to what actually happened during that period. And whilst there's a lot we don't know, and something about you know putting into perspective how long ago this was in comparison to other archaeological sites, really, I, it, it blows my mind really how um, how ancient you know the, the site is. And, you know, it's great to see that it's been named the UNESCO World Heritage Site and that it's been acknowledged this way. But I, I really think the interpretation is something, which is what we'll talk about. But, you know, that, let's go into, um, you know, what Gobekli Tepe is. It's located on the border of the, the southeastern border of Turkey, on the border of, of the Syrian border. And it's right in that fertile crescent where we know uh, modern civilization began. And, but it was first discovered in the 70s, wasn't it, by farmers? And they, what they noticed was these pot belly hills, and they actually ran into 
um, large stones buried in the hills and it ended up uh, being studied by archaeologists at the time who wrote it off as being a natural hill, didn't they? Yeah, and I think there was even um, examples of farmers kind of turning up these strange sort of carved rocks um, in their ploughs and things like that and archaeologists would come and look at them and just just write them off as kind of Roman ruins or, you know, more modern um, more modern creations. Um, it wasn't until uh, 1994, I think, that the first serious look at it from an archaeologist happened by um, a man by the name of Klaus Schmidt, who is um, part of the Heidelberg University in Germany. And um, he, the first time he saw the site, he um, realised well, he just had a thought that he's, he was going to spend the rest of his life there because it was so profound to him. Yeah, it's so interesting, Schmidt's um, you know, commitment and story as well. Um, and we'll come back to that a little bit, but I thought I'd just kind of say, you know, where the site is. So, Loka is close to the border. It's the southeastern Anatolia region of Turkey, which is 12, 12 kilometres uh, northeast of the city San Lurfa. Um and actually, Gebekli Tepe actually means Potbelly Hill in English. And um, there's actually other kind of theories as to what and ideas as to what the name means, and which which is you know a long story. But it, it's interesting to you know there were those murmurings. You know, it was the '60s that a archaeologist named Peter Benedict wrote it off as being um, a, a bunch of strange hills, but then. 30 years for Schmidt to come along and he'd been working at a site uh, called Navali Kori which was near and so what he recognised is in all these little carvings and the style of stones that were being uncovered in the area were very similar to these Neolithic sites he was working on and actually Navali Kori was uh, flooded by a dam and so he was looking for another site in the area and then this, this discovery came across and as you said he spent the rest of his life there yeah, and it just it blows my mind thinking about how long he would have been digging uh, around that area. I think they could only dig something like a third of the year or half of the year um, because it's so hot over there. And when they could dig, it was only for an hour or two um, a day, broken up into sections. Um, and throughout his almost 20 years or 20 plus years of excavating the site, they only, only ended up uncovering maybe 10%, I think, or a bit under 10% which is just mind-blowing to think of the scale of this of this site. That is the oldest evidence we have of any sort of megalithic stoneworking in, in the, on the planet. Yeah, I think he used to get, they used to rise at like four, 3 or 4 a.m. in order to avoid the, the hot hours of you know, the Turkish and Syrian um, environment. And then they would kind of take their findings for the day back to his house where they would um, have breakfast and kind of uncover th- things um, in in the the coverage uh, of his house. But twenty years, like it really does, like that that really kind of always, you know, I was always so appreciative of that. Like someone that would devote so much time to painstakingly, you know, slow work such as archaeology and and a site that we don't really understand. You know, like what do you think when you go when you're taken to a site? In '94, where we don't know really what, you know, there's nothing really precedenting that he's going to find anything significant there and really commit to doing something like that. Like obviously, he felt there was something significant to this, and he said that he was drawn to it, and he knew he'd spend the rest of his life there. Yeah, I think it would have taken someone like Schmidt. I don't think anyone would have been so determined to stay and work out exactly what was going on. Yeah, I can't imagine. Like, you always read about these new discoveries and archaeological finds, but to actually imagine day by day them on their hands and knees kind of uncovering grain by grain, it's kind of like, it's it's hard to imagine. I can't imagine myself doing that. The level of commitment is unbelievable, and archaeologists do it, you know, really that's how you know they base their careers. It's quite remarkable. Um, but Schmidt's work is particularly, I think, pivotal because of how important Gebekli Tepe is and uh, you know so it is this collection of t-shaped rocks and this is what they found in this pot belly hill um, but so what he found was that uh, the hill was not a natural uh, a natural knoll 
um, but it was actually a, a man-made um, series of hills that were built on top of each other. So there were these huge stone pillars that were arranged in circles um, with two central big T-shaped pillars up to 22 foot tall. The different enclosures had different sized uh, pillars and different quality of work, but the size and complexity of the carvings is really quite breathtaking when you see the pictures and so on the articles on the website we uh, we feature some of the, um, the pictures that really kind of represent how amazing this work was and you know with like you said there's only t less than 10 percent of it underground so it's 12 times as big sorry it's 12 football fields and it's 50 times larger than Stonehenge equally 90,000 square meters that is just but mind-boggling and it's 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 six thousand years older than stonehenge which is and when you think stonehenge is old and it's hard to imagine the context of that being built but go back another six thousand years on top of that and that's go back to tepi and the strange thing about it is there are so many each each stone circle with these stone um t-shaped pillars they're almost identical they've got slightly different sizings and alignments and artworks but it's pretty much the same pattern repeated again and again and again over this huge area of land which no one can explain and no one to my mind has come up with a, a reason for why they would do this it doesn't really make sense to me that's what's so so intriguing about Gebekli Tepe is that you know we really don't know you know what it represents and why it was put there and when you put it in the context too so you know, these huge pillars, they, these come, like you say, 6,000 years. So that's longer from us to supposedly when Stonehenge was built. So between Stonehenge and Gebekli Tepe, there's a longer period of time. And that's, I think that takes a lot of, you know, perspective to really appreciate how far in the past, you know, this is. And it really breaks, you know, our, breaks our, our modern conception of, you know, potentially the idea of what hunter gatherers were doing and you know there is also the opening of the door the potential of you know maybe there weren't people sorry there were people in that time that weren't other hunter gatherers and where did the ability to make these stones come from yeah and i think um that thinking about that is even more strange when you kind of put it in the perspective of what was happening on earth at that time and i think we spoke about that in our last podcast um about the younger dryas period and the earliest dating of Gobekli Tepe so far is um, to the period just after that um, Younger Dryas period ended. So there's all these kind of strange questions that keep popping up the more you go into learning about Gobekli Tepe. But um, one of the really strange things, well the strangest thing in my mind is uh, learning that the site itself was purposely buried um, after it was about a thousand years after it was finished being built the entire um, 22 football fields or whatever it was, was buried, um, which is one of the only reasons why we still, you know, have access to it today is because it was buried underground. Well, it was buried in increments, wasn't it? So, and that's the amazing thing about, because that was such a discovery of Schmidt and it must have absolutely been, you know, a watershed moment in his career when he did the carbon dating on the, the soil from surrounding the, the stone circles and finding because you can actually determine between uh, soil that's laid, been laid down by sediment and soil that has been purposely buried so it will all date and it will have a, a certain type of um, uh, yeah there's like analysis. a yeah there's like a uniformity to the soil it's like uh, it, there's no way it could have been done naturally because it all dates to the same period and it's all the same type of soil and it's all um, yeah, the so same it wasn't point. laid down, you know, by a period of time. Like, yeah, it wasn't. Like, it, from the bottom yeah, it wasn't. Top. It wasn't sort of hundreds of years of rain and flooding and um, wind and that sort of thing building up the soil. It was all in one big heap, just dumped on it. And and so what they could do is they would actually date the more superficial the the stones circles that were higher up or more close to the surface. Um, as being younger 
And so the site looked like it was actually used over 1,500 years and buried in increments. So they would actually look like they were using the a circle. They would create it and then they would bury it and then build another one on top or something like that because it's, it's this strange arrangement where they're built roughly around each other and on top of each other. And over 1,500 years or longer, they created these hills. And it's just an utter mystery, like how... Did people in these times one have the you know the the knowledge but then two the the purpose like it's a very very big undertaking right and you know it, one thing that really kind of stuck out for me is that you don't have the evidence of any civilization nearby and so there's and there's probably some explanations for that too isn't there that, especially considering the, the age of the site and how little we know about this time. Um, you know, does, you know there's, for instance, we say that there is no evidence of, um, you know, workers, for instance, like near Stonehenge, for example, you have evidence of um, dwellings and, and the workers and the pyramids, the Egyptian pyramids are the same. But near this huge site, the biggest site on the planet, the oldest site, we don't have any evidence. And I wonder if that's because the evidence has disseminated over time or whether, you know, maybe it was a gathering from, you know, surrounding communities. Yeah, that's one of the strange things about uh, the excavation so far and of the surrounding areas. There's no, there's been no pottery found. There's been no um, evidence of trash. You know, if, if you have a culture living somewhere, you usually find things that they've left that have been buried with the objects that they've built. Um, there's no... There's no burial sites, so it doesn't look like anyone was living there. Um, and there are no tools. That before Gobekli Tepe existed, the the oldest tools didn't even date back as far as Gobekli Tepe that could have built it. So you kind of wonder how on earth did they build it without the tools necessary to do it. Um, and also it's, it's not near um, a water source. So it's not near... A, if you're trying to build the biggest megalithic site on earth you probably need to be near running water or at least a dam or something to you know sustain yourself um especially over that sort of undertaking um so when you put all these things together it's sort of it's really bizarre it's really hard to imagine how it all came together i do wonder if that was different too though because as you said this does borderline on the end of the young with dries and the earth it was a very different place and just gone through this turbulent period of both mass sea level rises and and so forth. So maybe, maybe yeah, maybe there was work, but it it doesn't. You know, conventionally we can't you know find you know the the normal signposts of civilization. Mm, yeah, and the uh, the hard thing trying to piece all this together. One of the hardest things is that it's so old that it's it's earlier than any evidence we have of writing. Um, or written language um, anywhere in the world. It's I think the earliest form of written language is something like 3000 BC or around that area, around that sort of time. But yeah, Gobekli Tepe predates that by uh, 9,000 years or something along those lines. It's kind of bizarre. We're just saying these numbers. It's really hard to imagine what that means. But So the only thing really that's left to try and work it out, apart from the archaeological record, is you know, myths and legends and stories and um, symbolism among surviving cultures and, um, you know, language that cultures are still using today that could be tied back to periods in history that sort of span um, so so long ago. And when you get into, you know, archaeological records where there are no written language, it becomes very difficult. And of this age, this is why... And we know so little about it. You know, it, it becomes a com- complete mystery because we cannot. It's so far from things we can conventionally, you know, tie to um, historical civilizations that we know of. That it, you know, the people that that made Gobekli Tepe are a, a mystery. You know, even though they are, this is what really fascinates me. That these people are us. You know, whatever became, you know, our modern civilization, the people that made Gobekli Tepe are. You know, our, you know, our own um, descendants or of uh, w- w- what we would become descendants of. Yet, we know so little about them. That's, you know, 
that's why I think about Gebekli Tepe on a daily basis, I think, just because for me it anchors this last point of, you know, reachable evidence of where we came from, you know, in terms of solid modern humans, yet it just goes into the, you know, the darkness of complete, complete and utter mystery. It's such a strange thought thinking that it could have been buried underground forever as well. Like, it was just by complete chance that uh, Klaus Schmidt stumbled upon it. And, I mean, even if it was anyone but Klaus Schmidt, I feel like they wouldn't have given it as much importance as, as he did and as much time and, um, yeah, as much research that went into it. It could have easy, easily been missed. And the, the whilst it doesn't have written writing, it does have, like, a lot of the... the um, stone pillars have symbols on them and so there's carvings of of, of animals and um, certain shapes and um, representations of uh, what you know I guess you can call that language too but it's not a written language as such but there are many many animals across the different um, enclosures uh, that that have been uncovered which are very few but it does seem to show that they were trying to represent something. You know, they call this the oldest temple in the world. There was clearly a, a site of some kind of ritual or understanding or, you know, some kind of like bringing knowledge to the forefront and sharing it with people that, you know, we can't connect to. But the symbols do present an interesting, you know, kind of look into what was going on there, don't they? Um, they yeah they do and that there's there's strange occurrences of these symbols popping up uh, across you know different cultures across the world and similar motives and similar similar um, carvings and imagery and um, to get an idea of some of the images that are seen at Gobekli Tepe they're not they're not regular carvings that are carved into stone I mean there are some that are carved into stone but a lot of them are what's known as high relief um, carving which is instead of carving the stone, carving into the stone, you remove the outside of the stone and are left with an image. So um, at Gobekli Tepe, there's images of all kinds of animals, like foxes and birds, lions, snakes, scorpions, strange looking boars that look sort of prehistoric. Um, and they're, they're everywhere. And there's a lot of, oh, in almost every enclosure that they've found so far, there's been heavy amounts of vultures um, and birds of prey and things like that things that have no explanation as of yet um, but, you know if it was a place of people coming together and sharing information and learning and teaching then what were they learning by looking at all these animals and these symbols and they they must have had some sort of importance to these cultures because they've they've sort of been carried through um, to other parts of the world and um, yeah it's it's it's, it's. I have no idea what what it all means. <laughs> it's so it's so interesting Luke, because, as you say, you do see, you know, kind of echoes of the concepts used at Gebekli Tepe and the symbols and the animals. And but going back to the technology required so for for high relief carving, if you look at the pictures um, on if you Google Human Origin Project with Gebekli Tepe, uh, you'll see the article and uh, there's a picture of a it's like a lizard isn't it that's sitting it's a basically the lizard sitting looking down vertically on the on the pillar and that's called low relief stone cutting where they actually have to carve the details of the lizard so it actually sits on the surface of the pillar this huge t-shaped uh, stone pillar and and this it's basically the hardest type of of stone masonry you can do because it's so difficult the tools you have to get into for all the intricate details of the nails and the head and, and it has to be carved on the outside of a flat pillar and to me that I can't see how they did this you know with primitive tools um, but yeah yeah I think that's a really good point um, you know it's not just that, that they made a, a the oldest and the largest temple ever found they also used some of the hardest techniques of stone masonry and even the T-shaped pillars are huge. They're, I think the biggest ones are 22 foot tall, which is... Um, tall than a giraffe. Yeah. <laughs> well tall than a giraffe. So, I mean, I've been to the zoo and I've seen a giraffe. I, I haven't been to go back to Tepe, but I can't even comprehend the size. And trying to not only stand those 
T-shaped pillars up, but make sure you didn't drop them and crack any of the carvings that you just um, cut into them. And I think all of the T-shaped pillars and all most of the enclosures that they've found so far have been built upon flat bedrock. So, so were they allowed to place the bedrock? Is it does that what that means? Or I'm not sure. Uh, I think they either found a very flat piece of earth or leveled it out themselves. I mean, if they're doing, if they're moving. Um, 20 ton blocks of stone and they're carving high relief animals and um, are, are capable of building and burying this site, I feel like they could potentially have had the capability of levelling out the ground and you know having a having a playing field that was good to go from, from the start. I think Schmidt covers these kind of things because Schmidt wrote a lot of books on his work and on Gebekli Tepe and he um, talks about these kind of things that yeah and, and like for instance shaping bedrock for instance that's a quite very technical thing to do it's it seems like a very strange occurrence for people that are supposedly coming out of being hunter gatherers and it, it just brings more to the mystery we can't explain it um but o- overall you know these animals you know they, they do seem to echo throughout societies later on don't they and so for instance there's a lot of representations of the vulture as you said the fox is represented a lot um but then you do also see these symbols echoing throughout other cultures too so that it, from Gebekli Tepe it, and you know we knew we know it's the center of the agricultural revolution where we began to farm you can trace all the grains you can trace all the um you know many of the lineages of the sheep is it and goats and 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 that's a really interesting. Actually, we're going to cover that at a later point. The agricultural revolution centered around Gebekli Tepe and, and the evidence of that, which is you know fascinating, just paints a bigger picture of what's happening. But then the, the symbolism, because what we're stuck with, and this is where um, you know the, what the human origin is based on, is to follow the evidence of what we know about these occurrences and really the symbols and you know how we can follow them through subsequent uh, cultures and and um, you know mythologies and teachings you know what can we trace back as being um you know potentially connecting to get get back to the tip and they, they happen all around the world don't they yeah and i think it's hard to picture for our modern day um cultures where we we rely on written language and um technological communications and things like that but if we put ourselves in the mindset of these ancient cultures that used that for them symbolism was one of the main um, ways of transmitting information um, and that's something we don't really use so much but it pops up again and again in ancient cultures and there's these strange connections between old sites um, that tie back to Gebekli Tepe through these similar images and similar symbols and um, I don't think we've mentioned mentioned, but on the um, the T-shaped pillars they're, they're, uh, they've been carved with hands uh, sort of long arms on the side, of, running down the side of them with hands at the end, um, which is really similar to, I don't know if anyone has seen pictures of Easter Island, the Moai statues on Easter Island. Um, I think we featured some, there was some on our Instagram, yeah, where, where you, they dig under the, like the, the platform of the Moai heads and there's actually these hands. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, I always thought it was just heads, but... I think they've excavated a lot of them and they're, they're huge standing figures with these stone heads and along the side, almost identical to Gobekli Tepe, these huge statues have long arms um, with hands poking out the sides. Um, and Easter Island was thousands of years, dates thousands of years later to Gobekli Tepe, yet the symbols are almost identical. And that's, not sure if anyone's come to the conclusions as to what that means um, for Gobekli Tepe, but it seems to be, you know, anthropomorph- anthropomorphizing. Anthropomorphic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a long word. Um, yeah, either remembering ancestors or celebrating ancestors or celebrating people or, you know, teachers or gods or some, some sort of human figure was, was being depicted by these huge pillars. They weren't just... Um, standing stones like you see at Stonehenge or um, other stone circle sites around the world they were purposely made to represent um, people yeah the 
and there are similar sites too. There's some similar T-shaped symbolism happening. I think it's Malta and some Spanish. I think it might be. Um, I can't remember the the island now, but there are that this ancient kind of symbolism does show up. But there certainly was seems to be a representation. So you have these two bigger pillars in the middle, which are facing each other. So it seems like you know people facing each other, and, and there are also symbols based on that. Um, you know, two heads or two um, two curved uh, lines or figures facing each other with, with a division in the middle, and that it, they are all represented around this meeting of these two central points. So whether that's people or whether that's God, who knows? It's it's so hard to um, to place. But as you say, there is this connection to East Island where there, and also in Indonesia, actually, you see similar styles of carving. Um, you know, these figures with strange large heads, for instance, that are similar to the style. But and um, there's also penises um, carved out and other strange things that and some astronomical markings too. Yeah, I'm not too sure about the ast- astronomical stuff. I haven't seen too much of that, but I've definitely seen, yeah, as you said, strange depictions of erect penises on um, certain pillars, which is, you know, I don't know if anyone's been to ancient uh, to Egypt, but there's a lot of uh, hieroglyphs of really similar depictions of these people or animals or anything with this, yeah, similar symbols of... And same as um, that you find it in Indonesia, you also find it in Australian, Indigenous Australian uh, society as well, where there's, they have the, the phalanx um, symbol. So, I mean, obviously that's universal to humans, but the, it, 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 there's also a similar style of, um, of uh, drawing them as well too, isn't it? Yeah, and, and not only those places, but also in... Uh, in native in the, the Native American tribes of North America, um, erect totem poles, and a lot of the imagery on these totem poles are very similar to the images depicted on these pillars in Gobekli Tepe. Which is, it's bizarre thinking that you know Native American cultures are still around today, and they could potentially be carrying the same memory or the same traditions that were either implemented or. Um, you know, relearned or taught or whatever it was at Gobekli Tepe and, and carried through all of these years. Um, it's, yeah, it's hard to grasp grasp that fact that, you know, these things can potentially survive if, if they have. And there, there has been some, uh, some scholars have written about how the T-shape might even be the earliest form of the cross. Uh, you find this in the, the Celts? Yeah, the, the Celtic tribes... Um, and the, the ancient Irish cross, there's there's um yeah there's lots of there's lots of old images of Irish crosses that look almost identical to the T-shaped pillars that go back to Tepe and um yeah and then you see it in Egypt with the Ankh symbol which is not quite the same but it's it's a similar concept all the way up to pre-Christian and Christian um, idea of the cross um, you know it's all over Neolithic UK all through Ireland Scotland over to France, um, yeah, in Malta, like you said. Um, it's just sort of, yeah, whether that's just coincidence, but, it, I mean, if you start bumping up against coincidence after coincidence, it starts making you sort of question if there's something more going on. I mean, there's no doubt something of Gobekli Tepe resonated somewhere in the world. And uh, one other thing is that there, there's like a handbag-style symbol and numbers of them that resembles you see things in um i think it's peru isn't it south america and at certain sites around there that have the exact same symbol and you actually find that around the world too don't you yeah i think um i recently read a book about the new zealand maori which are which are a tribe um in new zealand who um one of their myths they talk about um one of their ancestors going to this sacred site and returning with three handbags of knowledge um which the, if you see these images that go back to Tepe, they look just like handbags. They've got sort of a curved hemisphere top with a square bottom. And, um, yeah, it could also represent a sort of early uh, attempt of um, squaring a circle or, you know, that, that ancient Egyptian concept of as above, so below, trying to reconcile the heavens and the earth. And, yeah, there's so many, there's so many avenues you can go down with these images. It's really hard to... 
to know where to stop. It's interesting, though, that you do even find... Um, so w- when you go back this far in, in history, the problem that you know, we have now is that you know, without written, written word... And actually, just on that, like, you know, when you look at Egyptian hier- hieroglyphs, which is considered a language, you know, symbols could really be a written language that we don't understand to. So that's kind of maybe something um, that could be considered. So perhaps to them these kind of carbon could have been some kind of language. But when you kind of track back in the language of of both the history of, for instance, ancient Egypt, they talk of times before and they talk of their time being Zep Tepe, don't they, which might relate to the idea of Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, it's funny that the, when, you, when you don't have any written language to go off, it's sort of you've only got spoken word and, and existing yeah, symbols and, and existing words that are still, I, I mean were used by ancient cultures um but there is a yeah there's a strange connection it, the egyptians talk about the first time um called zep tepi it's like a quasi sort of mythical first time where they inherited all their knowledge and they were brought back to culture and um yeah there's an interesting link with the with the word tepe which i think in turkish has upwards of 20 plus meanings um but it's in the area of the in, in the part of the world that the Egyptians talk about, um, and you know they they were talking about this, and people were trying to surmise where it was, and then Gobekli Tepe was found, and sort of put these sort of un, unsolved questions. It sort of yeah opened up a lot of um, potential areas of, of research for answers for these seemingly mythical storylines that have potentially been you know opened up. Yeah, like were they were the Egyptians talking about Gobekli Tepe when they said that maybe they were? It's I mean it's completely reasonable for that to be actual just speaking about the time when you know ancestors came together and put together this you know because there's stone masonry evidence which com- clearly went to um, these kind of knowledge were projected to Egypt at later times. Um, so that. Um, that's fascinating, but you also find it elsewhere too. You, you, it's in Buddhism as well, and that, that, for instance, the use of the vulture. Yeah, I think that in ancient Buddhism, it's said that um, that at a high main, mountaintop sanctuary that is known as Vulture Peak, um, that's where knowledge was first passed down to a Buddha. Which is, you know, we were talking before about birds of prey and vultures and the symbolism there. Um, it is in the region of the world that. Um, Buddhism is thought to originate from, you know, coming from the north through India um, down into China. It's, uh, yeah, it's a it's a strange concept thinking that p- these potentially, you know, these really profound ancient um, ideologies and cultures could have stemmed from the same original source, which is, uh, yeah, something you don't really hear too much about, but it's really, a really fascinating possibility. It's interesting too. You can um, you can also trace a little bit to uh, there was a matriarchal cult back, well, the, like a religion back then, and they drew and you you find these in sites around Turkey. That, uh, they carved carvings of very voluptuous women um, and seemed to uh, worship the, the fertility of a um, of, of a curve curvaceous woman and this seems to go through india is it the shakti cult yeah the shakti cult they're still uh they're still members of the shakti cult in i think it's in orissa in india um but yeah they're a, they're a matriarchal cult that that focus on fertility and life and they're very loving and very non um you know non-aggression there's no there's no fighting or warfare um but an interesting thing about their you know, they symbolise this this um, woman that almost looks pregnant, um, which is very characteristic of Gobekli Tepe, which is known as a pot belly hill. And um, it doesn't take too much of a stretch of the imagination to picture a pot belly hill, hill as the uh, stomach of a pregnant woman. And um, I think another another meaning of another uh, description for Gobekli Tepe is the is the hill with a navel, which kind of ties it into that. Um, human theme yeah there's, there's a lot of layers to this symbolism and, and you see the idea of the navel is somewhere where um, ideas and information and knowledge is born out of 
um, not just in Gobekli Tepe, but across the world in places like Cusco in Peru. It's known as the navel. Um, you know, Uluru is thought of in Australia um, as the navel of Australian culture, at least in the Aboriginals' minds. There, there are sites all over the world where this navel um, symbolism is present, and that's tied directly into this Shakti cult who who know that they're so old that no one knows exactly where they originated from, but it's it was somewhere to the north of India, which is towards Gobekli Tepe, which is a yeah, it's a strange thought to have all these cultures stemming out of this region of the world where Gobekli Tepe pops up. It's funny because we we already know that that's where we come from. You know, we call it the first whole crescent. We we know we scientifically say this is where farming and the beginning of you know our our civilization began. But you know these kind of connections. It's more detail, isn't it? And it just kind of paints a picture as to how God, how you know potentially complex and powerful these you know whatever the knowledge was being stored at Quebecli Tepe because it was being stored too, wasn't it? You know they buried it to make sure it wasn't either destroyed or stolen or... Yeah, it, it makes sense if it was a site where the first knowledge was taught and, you know, really profound information was shared that you would want to preserve it. You wouldn't want it to be lost to, to time, to be slowly eroded away. And it must have... It must have the ancient culture who built it or who lived there or who whatever they were doing, they would have had to have a good reason to bury it. It would have taken... I don't know, thousands and thousands of people, months and months to bury that. Imagine trying to bury Stonehenge right now, and this site is 50 times bigger than Stonehenge. It, it, they went to a massive trouble to, to to bury it correctly and to bury it in a certain way to and perfectly as well because you know we, we're literally unearthing it nearly 12,000 years later in 1994. It's crazy to think of. You know, it sounds like a movie, doesn't it? But this actually happened, and... You know, one thing you mentioned before too is that we find these echoes all around the planet, but there's a very, very interesting link, you know, between one of the symbols on one of the pillars to, uh, and you find it, you know, Indigenous Australian. Uh, they actually, use, it's it's very well, you know, um, often used in in their language, and it's, it's nearly identical. And you know, when you start drawing these language links, and you know, th- these are the really, really interesting lines of evidence where we came from i think yeah and uh, yeah I, I still can't i can't really wrap my head around how that even works how something so old can still you know the, there's still echoes of it today and you know there's potentially people out there who know and understand what these symbols mean um i guess we'll find out we're definitely gonna find out we're going to be you know gebekli tepe is going to be the center of you know many articles um, for the Human Origin Project. You know, we're going to have many people and researchers presenting their um, their findings and their, um, you know, their theories on it too. So, you know, um, the, the article up on the website now is, you know, the baseline knowledge. And that's really what this show is about. We're going to have more um, discussions on this. We're going to interview people. And, you know, potentially too, we're looking at... Um, getting a group to go to give a good Bethley Tepe. That's one thing I definitely want to do is I want to go to the site, have to go to the site. Um, and so that's another thing to live and experience it as well. Yeah, I can't wait to go. I, I yeah, I think it will be the pictures you see, the pillars are three times, four times as big as the people that look, are looking at them. I, I can't imagine the power that it must, it must give to you. Um, and also just thinking back to the cradle of civilization and you know the agricultural revolution in my head it's it's farmers um slowly learning how to farm and slowly teaching that and slowly spreading across the land but having a site of this complexity that potentially was the place for that to happen having a physical place um it just yeah it's it's insane it's like it, it's so you know you, you look at these other ancient sites in the world with cultures that were already set up and they, they knew how to build and they knew what to do but not knowing how these people at Gobekli the Tepe went about what they did it's yeah it's really it's really uh, mind boggling completely mind boggling and the mind boggling problem that we're going to follow a lot and cover more so you know I'm really looking forward to that um, for those that want to read more about Gobekli Tepe you can go onto the website and look at the article on the oldest temple 
in the world. Um, also, there's a YouTube video that summarizes you know, some of the um, dimensions and details of the size, so check that out. And um, yeah, if you have any thoughts or um, areas of research you'd like us to cover, please um, leave them in the comments uh, of this of this show and you know please um you know jump on the social channels and talk about this because i really you know i i go to places you know where people are talking about supposedly important concepts and i think everyone should be talking about gebekli tepe nearly all the time because it's <laughs> it's only 10 percent of it is uncovered and to me it's just like i, I want to know what's there so yeah i'm sure there are other people out there like that too yeah and it's great it's great having you know, having this platform to, to bounce ideas off and, and, you know, get as many different perspectives on it as we can to try and piece it together. Because it's not just a, a individual archaeological site. It's a potentially, it's the it's the birthplace of potentially many other ancient sites and ancient cultures. And um, yeah, it's really it's really exciting to, to you know get get lots of opinions, get lots of ideas, and lots of avenues of, of research. Um, to try and piece it all back together. It's really, um, it's really exciting to be part of. It completely is. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. All right. I think we covered, you know, you can only really scrape the surface, you know, but I think we're going to have to bury what we've just done and leave it for next time. So um, I think next week, what are we going to talk about next week? Uh, I think maybe we we'll talk about Stonehenge. Yeah, that seems fitting. Yeah, we're, we're going to jump through these different topics that are kind of well-known and, these, we're going to go deeper and deeper into you know the lesser known too. There's lots of lots and lots of research to come and very lots of interesting topics. All right, Steph, we'll see you next week. Yeah, see you, Steve. Have a good week. Thank you for listening to today's show. For more information, you can read the full transcript, articles, and discussion on our website, humanoriginproject.com. You can visit us on social media at Human Origin Project on Facebook and The Human Origin Project on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter or join the forum boards and email list to keep up to date with all the new information. And if you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review because it helps others to find this information and helps us to bring you the topics you want to discuss and hear about. Until next week, I hope your life is filled with happiness, healthiness and harmony.